We'll be in 1 Samuel, getting started on the historical books here, 1 Samuel, and we'll be dealing with the first couple chapters today, the book of 1 Samuel. Let's begin our time in prayer, asking God to bless our time together. Father, we thank you that we can join together, thank you that we can sing of even the heaviness that we often experience. We thank you that even through that, we can come through that, and even during it, and give praise to you because you are a good and wonderful, a gracious and merciful God. We thank you for your word for the book of Samuel. We thank you for the imperfect lives, even of a woman and her husband, and through their choices, through their petition to you, uh, this young man that then goes on to do so much for you. We thank you for their example, for even the heartache they went through. We thank you that you hear and grant our petitions, and that you hear us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God hears and grants our petitions, and we're going to spend some time in 1 Samuel over the next couple of weeks, and notice that this theme really continues through the first four or five chapters, that God is listening to the petitions of his people. And in this first week, we understand that he does so personally. That God actually hears, actually knows, actually is concerned with our hearts, our desires, our aches, all the things that oftentimes cause us a whole lot of grief. And God answers them personally. And I would remind us that as we begin 1 Samuel, if you read through the Bible and go through this somewhat chronologically, that 1 Samuel is still, in these opening chapters, during the time of the judges. The, the society of the people of this day is still anarchy. The society that we saw in Ruth that, that caused God's judgment to come that, that made this family flee to Moab and then return is still going on. Everyone is still doing what is right in their own eyes and it informs us why uh, Eli would have such a low opinion of this poor woman as she prays to God. Why no one seems to care about Eli's sons and their acts. There is no human king in Israel at this time. That will come, but God was supposed to be their king. In fact, the worship of the king of God Almighty had become even defiled by the very men charged to be priests of God. The worship in Israel had become so defiled that Samuel notes with almost a sense of amazement that the earnest worship of Elkanah and his family, as we'll see in this first chapter. And in the midst of this national distress, this national crisis, one woman is also likely, likewise distressed and in crisis. At her lowest, Hannah, in this first and second chapter, goes to God with her petition something that she has appeared to be doing for many, many years as she endured the torment from her rival. And finally, with hope gone, but for God, God hears and grants Hannah's petition. Today, as we begin looking at 1 Samuel, particularly how God hears and grants our petitions, first of all, on a personal level, as we see with Hannah, in considering this narrative with Hannah, we want to see as we have in the past with our other narratives, considering it as a story, as the narrative it is in its form. <clears throat> then we want to examine and apply even the song and prayer of Hannah as she exalts God, even as she gives back to him the son of answer, the very son she prayed for. And so let's consider 
the narrative as it comes out in our Bible, as God has preserved it for us. <clears throat> we'll make comments along the way. And here in 1 Samuel chapter 1, it says, There was a certain man of Ramoth Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jehoram, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, an Ephratite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. The introduction here in 1 Samuel is of this man who is from the hill country of Ephraim. This is the district of Zoph, probably around the city of Ramathi Ramathium, excuse me. And that's approximately 40 kilometers northwest of Jerusalem. If you, if you remember the map of the ancient world, about 40 miles, 40 kilometers, excuse me, northwest of Jerusalem. And he has two wives. Consider that probably a problem to begin with. Here he is, and he has two wives. Some uh, think that maybe Elkanah has married Penina as the second wife because Hannah has been barren and has not given him children. It's possible, but it's not provable. And here they are, and the book introduces this family, this imperfect family. If you think your family's messed up, well, read some of the Bible characters. Their families are messed up too. Here they are, and here he comes, and it says now, then in verse 3, that this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. This is where the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. We see here Shiloh is the worship center. After the conquest of the land in the book of Joshua, the ark comes to rest in Shiloh. The tent of meeting there is there. Like, likely there's been a permanent structure kind of built up around the tent of meeting. We'll see later on that Eli is leaning against the doorpost. I'm not sure how you do that on a tent, but here he is, and he's leaning against the doorpost. And so the worship is in Shiloh, and Elkanah is noted, really, the, the emphasis seems to be as actually giving him some praise for still being faithful, if barely. He's supposed to really actually be going up three times a year, but he goes up once a year to worship, to give his sacrifice with his family as well. But Hannah, he gives a portion of the sacrifice, the, those who would give offerings often shared in them in the Old Testament, depending on the offering or sacrifice. But to Hannah, though, instead of just the little portion he gave to Penina to her sons and daughters, Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her. And notice this in the narrative, though the Lord had closed her womb. Why was she barren? Because God had made it that way. And then the story takes a turn. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her because the Lord had closed up her womb. As God, much as God is in control, we often can't control the reactions of others. And here she is, Hannah, probably maybe even somewhat displaced because of this other wife. She has no children. It is a point of pain for her. And there's her rival. Every chance she gets, especially with the sacrifice, especially when it's time to go worship God. And she just starts needling and irritating her and calling her out and going, nah, 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 I've got sons and daughters. Would that really put you in a worship mood? 
So every time you want to go worship God, your rival is there and needling you. Hannah was given a double portion, but the Lord had closed up her womb. And so it went on year by year. Could you imagine this? One year, yes. Two years, maybe we can make it through. Three years, oh. The phrase here describes a continual every year by year. This goes on for a long time. And as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, that is Hannah, as often as Hannah went up to the Lord, to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Her rival provoked her over and over again every time they went to worship. And therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. If she was around today, there would be a doctor that would give her a prescription because she's depressed. She's hurting within her own soul. Alcana being at least a little bit in tune with his wife, looks at her and says, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? He has a deep abiding love for Hannah, but she has a need that even he can't meet. She has a need, a desire that even her husband isn't capable of of taking care of because the Lord was the one who had closed her womb. This continual provoking year after year was causing the same distress year after year, causing Hannah to cry out to God year after year. It reminds me of the parable of the unjust judge from Luke 18. And Jesus there tells us it's not because the judge actually feared God or cared what man actually thought, but because this woman kept coming year by year and and continually uh, going after the judge and throwing her petition at the judge that the judge finally sees it her way. Each year, Hannah goes up, Penina goes up, Penina is irritating and provoking Hannah. And each year, Hannah is going and laying herself out before God. And each year, the answer doesn't come. Each year, there's silence. Each year, her husband comes and says, Hannah, why aren't you eating? Aren't I better than if you had ten sons? But notice her response to this distress. And after they had eaten, after they drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. This word for temple does describe the temple later on, but is also used to describe the palace of God, the meeting place of God even. Here she goes, and the family's still having a good time. They're having the family reunion, as it were. They're eating, they're, they're drinking, they're having a, a wonderful time. And she slips away to go and meet with God. She goes, and Eli's sitting there as almost an afterthought to the story. She goes, and she was deeply distressed. And she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. I don't know if you've ever been in the position of Hannah to be praying so much that you're weeping. So distressed in your soul, so provoked by by the sin around you or your own sin or or those who are provoking you to, to be praying so desperately that tears come. But her response to the provoking, her response to her enemy here is to go to God. Where most of us would lash out. Right? Most of us would be told, why don't you have a Snickers? You're hangry. Hannah goes to the only one who can do something about it. She goes and she pours herself out to God. And she vowed a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, If you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant. 
but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. It's interesting here. Hannah doesn't call upon the father, the gentle one, the Abba. She calls on the mighty, the Lord of hosts, quite literally, the Lord of the armies. This could be the Lord of the heavenly armies, the Lord of heaven itself and its domain, or even the Lord of the armies of Israel. And she calls to that one to remember her as his servant. Remember your servant. Give me a son. And then in her vow, she promises to give him back and even makes a Nazarite vow upon him. Imagine being born, starting to grow up and finding out your parents made a vow to God and there's a whole bunch of things you can't do. And yet, she calls out to God and makes a promise. And many people have done the same thing in war and in distress. But few see the answer and even fewer still actually fulfill their vow to God. And here she is. She's in such distress. She makes such a promise to God. And as she continues praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. And just notice how wicked the day is that Eli thinks she's drunk. Therefore, Eli took her to be drunken, a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, how long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. Now, some things we should understand here about Eli's response. First is the state of Israel. As we continue through the narrative, you find that Hophni and Phinehas are carousing at the very house of the Lord. They're taking things that belong to God. They're doing things with the women who are supposed to serve there that they're not supposed to do. And this is considered normal. But something else that help us understand is that historically and with other scriptural reference, we find that prayer was predominantly audible through most of the biblical times. Even in the New Testament, we have the two men going up to the temple in Jesus' parable, the, the publican and the Pharisee. And the sinner won't even lift his eyes to God, but prays, you know, forgive me, a sinner. And here's the Pharisee patting himself on the back. God, aren't you wonderful to have me? Both of those praying out loud. And so it's an oddity here that Hannah is so desperate in her prayer, so distressed that the words won't even come out. And part of that causes Eli to accuse Hannah of the very things of being worthless that his sons are. The priests... The ones who are supposed to be teaching the people the word of God, the ones supposed to be interceding for them on behalf of them to God, are worthless. Here, Hannah is pouring out her soul so distressed that the words won't even come out. And Eli's first thought isn't she's in distress, as she's drunk. And yet, in her distress, she comes and answers, no, my Lord, talking to Eli, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Reminds me of Jesus in the garden. So desperate. Lord, Father, if this be your will, let this cup pass. Jesus knows what's coming. She's so in it right now. Lord, your servant, remember me. One passing glance of thought. Give me a son. I've been pouring my soul out before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman. 
For all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. We are all anxious. We are all vexed. Our world, instead of finding its answer to anxiety and vexation in God, has decided to design pills for it. Here, you're anxious, take this pill! Instead of going to the one who can take care of it. Here, Hannah comes to the only one who can deal with her vexation, with her anxiety. It's interesting, as wicked as the time is, as much of a failure as Eli is, verse 17, we see that he knows the heart of God, the goodness of God, the mercy and grace of God to assure her that God has heard her petition. Eli's response, Eli answered, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant you your petition that you may have made to him. And she said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate. Didn't we just see a few verses ago she refused to eat? She was so depressed. And her face was no longer sad. Where's the answer for distress? Where's the answer for depression? To pour it out to God. And Eli, knowing the character of God, probably having experienced it himself, that he hasn't received judgment yet for his failings. Even though he can't adequately and has not adequately taught his sons about God, he responds to this woman in distress and says, May God grant you your petition. This is a good, he's a merciful, he's a gracious God that hears and grants petitions. And notice verse 19. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife. And the Lord, the Lord remembered her. And in due time, or at the right time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She called his name Samuel. For she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. God remembered. God heard. God granted this petition. It's interesting because as we get to the next part of the chapter, the vow that she had made back All the way in verse 11, her husband could have nullified. According to the law of God from Moses, he had the right to nullify this, but he went along with it. I can only imagine what Elkanah was thinking after finally Hannah is expecting. But don't miss the best, greatest character in this isn't Hannah isn't Elkanah, isn't Eli, it's God. God remembered. God heard. God granted her petition. Go forward to verse 21. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to the offer to the Lord, the yearly sacrifice, and to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up. For she said to her husband, As soon as the child is weaned, I will bring him so that he may appear in the presence of the Lord and dwell there forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you have weaned him only. May the Lord establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her. Along with a three-year-old bull and an ephath of flour and a skin of wine, she brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh, and the child was young. Probably, we're talking three to four years old by now. Back in the day, women nursed longer for many reasons, including the health benefits, and they did not have baby food. 
here she has weaned him and the child is still young. Could you imagine being this mother and finally he is weaned and you have to keep your promise to God. This one you prayed for. This one, even as his name says, you asked God for. And now it's time. And you take the bull, you take the flower, you take the wine as an offering to the Lord. Especially for the one, as the law requires, that opens the womb, the firstborn. The child being young, as she goes, they slaughtered the bull. They brought the child to Eli, and she said, O my Lord, as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who is standing here in your presence praying to the Lord for for this child I prayed. And the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. Hannah keeps her vow. The vow of Canaan could have nullified, but because of his love for God, because of his love for Hannah, he supported and encouraged. He told her, do what you think is best. And even though she weaned the child, she kept her promise. She carried him for nine months. She weaned him for possibly several years. And yet now she'll see him one time a year. But even the bittersweet that is to leave her son in the service of God, her heart rejoices. Consider even in chapter 2. Chapter 2 beginning in verse 1, it says, And Hannah prayed and said, This is as she's leaving her son. My heart exults in the Lord. This should sound very similar to Luke. My soul magnifies the Lord. Her response to God answering her prayer. Even as she leaves her young son is praise. This prayer of praise She rejoices, she exalts in the Lord for exalting her strength. My horn is exalted as her strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. She recognizes God is the one who saves from her distress. God is the one that triumphs her over her enemies, even that other wife. God's the one that heard. God's the one that answered. And notice how she revels in his uniqueness, in God's uniqueness. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Hannah would make a good prophet, Isaiah. In Isaiah 40, 18, God there describes how unique he is. There is none like me. Who would you compare me to? Hannah here says the same thing. There is none holy like the Lord. For there is none beside you. There is no one like the rock that is God. Her praise revels in the uniqueness of God. She calls out, others and ourselves to be humble talk no more so very proudly let not arrogance come from your mouth for the lord is a god of knowledge and by him actions are weighed god is the judge and so we should be humble i can only imagine as she, this is pouring forth of her that she kind of gives the side eye to penina don't be proud anymore penina Don't be arrogant. God is the judge. In fact, in the next few verses, she's going to revel in the God who is the God that reverses things. Notice here, the bows of the mighty are broken, 
but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The weak are strengthened, the self-made are hungry, and the hungry are made full. The barren have seven, the fertile is now barren. Verse 6, we see the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. The dead become alive. The poor are rich. Everything is reversed in God. He rejoices that God hears the distress of the soul and reverses it. Penina, who couldn't be happy with the children she had to the point she has to dig at the one who has none, now weeps even while she has many children because Hannah is no longer barren. The dead are alive, the poor are rich. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit the seed of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. All of God's reverses are possible because, as the end of verse 8 says, he is the creator. The foundations, as the pillars of the earth, God is the one who set them up. Who could contend with such power? And so she praises God, her creator, the creator of all things, because he has used his power to grant her petition that he's heard. Notice this contrast between God's children versus his enemies. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Penina could not prevail in all her might. Hannah prevailed in her dependence on God. And now, even as she leaves her young son, she rejoices. Her response is praise. In verse 10, something we'll return to in, in the next week as we consider God doing this, not just personally, but corporately. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Here, in what could be a bit of a prophetic moment, for likely the first time historically, we see God, through Hannah, expressing this twin idea of the anointed, that is the Messiah, being God's king. Here in a time as Samuel starts, there is no king in Israel. And in her praise, the adversaries of the Lord are broken because the Lord is the judge and he gives strength to his king and exalts the strength of the horn of his anointed. We'll return to that idea as we get into the corporate aspects of this next week. But notice the praise. Praise of one who gave up her son, the son she prayed for, out of great distress. Verse 11 tells us that Alkina went home to Ramah, and the boy was ministering before, to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. Would this be your response? If God finally answered the prayer, the distress of your heart, and when you had been in such distress, you had made a promise, and now the promise cost you dearly. If you were in Hannah's sandals, 
If you have prayed for a child and prayed for a child year after year, suffering through, through the hatred uh, uh, of your enemy, finally God has answered. And now it's time to leave him. Would you respond in praise? Or would you be back in the depression, sad, not eating, Really, we should ask ourselves as we consider this narrative, as we consider how it progresses, as we consider the moving parts and how God answers the prayer, the petition of Hannah having heard her. We should ask ourselves when God in mercy and grace hears and grants our petitions, is our response exalting? Is our first response to say, my soul magnifies the Lord? Or as Hannah says, I I exalt, my heart exalts in the Lord. Is that our response? Or is it, oh, God finally got my wish true. I finally rubbed the God lamp enough to finally, he finally gave in. Or is it praise that overflows? When God in mercy and grace hears our petitions but answers with no or wait, do we still exult? When he says no to something we want, something that's good, when he says wait, Or maybe even the answer is silence. Is our response still to exalt? Do the tears stop because we know he hears? We can leave it at his merciful feet. Or do we go back? And if the story were different... She leaves, the tabernacle goes back and still won't eat. Her face is still sad and Alcana is still going, Hannah, what's, what, what can I do? Do you want a Snickers bar? Even though there was nothing Alcana could have done. Or do we go, God is in control. God has heard. God will grant if it's his will. God will do what is best and most glorious when the answer is no, when the answer is wait or silence, is our response still to rejoice, to magnify the Lord. What heart-distressing, bitter, weeping petition do you need to take to God to be heard? Sure, we all have them. Maybe it's someone that we've prayed years and years and years that they would accept Jesus. Or even it's something as physical a need as, Lord, give a child. Sometimes we have this distress and we forget about the one who hears We forget about the one who hears, who grants. Just put yourself in Hannah's sandals, year after year. The whole structure of the narrative, the whole progress of it, describes for us that she is going to the tabernacle year after year and pouring her heart out to God, just as after year after year her enemy, her her rival there, is poking at her. And yet she goes year after year and prays and pours out her heart. What heart distressing, bitter weeping petition do you need to bring to God? Because it just have stopped. It just has seemed purposeless because the answer has been wait. Maybe we should take a clue from Hannah 
just continue to bring it to God and leave it there. So that one day when he answers, we realize it was him. And we can then, in response, say, my heart exalts in the Lord. The narrative of Hannah shows us that God hears. God grants our petitions. On a personal level, and we'll see that Samuel is also the answer for an unspoken prayer, corporately or nationally, as we'll look at next week. Let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you that you are good, that there is none like you. Lord, I pray that our response to your character, your person would be that our heart rejoices in you. Lord, help us to trust you enough to bring our bitter weeping and heart-distressing petitions to you. And then to have enough trust to lay them at your feet and wait on you. Lord, that our response to your answer, whether it's wait or no or yes, would to be met to magnify your glorious name to praise you for being who you are, our good, our merciful, our gracious God. Lord, we thank you for this narrative of Hannah, for all that she had to endure, that you would place it in your word to be an example to us, to show us that you do hear and you do grant our petitions. Lord, as we bring them to you this week, our personal ones, Lord, we also look forward to next week. We pray for our nation that you would hear and grant our deep-hearted petitions about our nation. That you be working there as well, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.